Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 29. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. I am on the road. I'm in North Carolina. Uh, hey, John. Visiting my daughter. Got my got the wear and the gear here. Episode 29. Busy week. So we had so much going on. I was in Boston. I was in Vegas with you for the SAS Explore, which was our first event with them and it went really extremely well. Um, I'm now here. You're there. We've got a busy pod. We'll go as fast as we can. Unbelievable week, Dave. I got to tell you. We got to uh, talk about that hack too, John, in Vegas. The MGM hack. That's hopefully you're going to talk about that. But well, we stayed at the Aria, so we'd lot to go there. I have some inside hallway conversations there too. Um, but I mean, just I mean, just this was probably one of the biggest news weeks and busy activity weeks. I mean, Apple launched an iPhone feels like a month ago, but it was just earlier in the week. The ARM IPO was hyped to the over the moon hyped. Okay, but they landed. They got they landed their IPO up 24 so the first day. Everyone was expecting the IPOs maybe not to work, but everyone's now asking our IPOs back. Arms IPO worked. A lot of people thought it was overvalued. Uh, Databricks as a result just got their mega funding. Series I, Dave, moving down the alphabet for that private company. You know, Series A startup, now they're on Series I in the alphabet. $43 billion valuation. They're prepping to go to public with the AI hype and this AI seems to be this next generation platform for the technology industry. Instacart files an IPO. Who was next? Will there be a bull rush into the IPO market? That's the big thing. Some people are saying that ARM's overhype. Scott Rainovitz thinks so. Some were saying hey, there's nothing to do with AI. Meanwhile, ARM's pumping AI into the into the thing. Ah, the DOJ. nothing to do with AI. You can... <laughs> Hello, <laughs> facial recognition on an iPhone. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Jesus. Just do the rundown of what's happening. Oh my the Google's God. On, the Google trial is happening with the Department of Justice. That's pretty sp big spectacle, massive in and of itself. The MGM ransomware hack. Caesars got hacked too, Dave. They paid up big, 15 million. They were yet to paid. Caesars was socially engineered um, on an outsourced IT support vendor. Again, more technical stuff to dig into. Larry Ellison has never been to Redmond and Microsoft's campus ever in his history. And this week, the first time, again, the Apple iPhones launched. Unity changes their pricing for the game engine. Total changeover. They want to charge for installs. We tracked HashiCorp with their big changeover. This is where people get head, head faked. Tracking installs is messy. This is a huge implication. This Unity engine is really powerful for developers, for the metaverse, for um, spatial um, VR. The, uh, Apple's headsets, for instance, Vision, are all based upon this kind of technology. So they're changing the game on structure. It's going to have a huge implications for developers, especially in, in uh, graphics and AI as well. Instacart filed an IPO. Auto workers are striking. Hollywood people are striking. Dave, it's an unbelievable week. Every week, John, is unbelievable. I love it. <laughs> well, let's get into the top story. I mean, we, I couldn't stop seeing and hearing all the, the hype. Um, and then CNBC doing victory dances all week. With what, on how great arm? The market is, yeah, on arm, and, and, but arm did good. I mean, they did match the numbers, right? They came out uh, at 51 a share and closed up and they were up 24%. So. Uh, over sixty billion dollar valuation. I thought the, I I know thought, it's, it's I thought the action was interesting, John, because I mean, I, I've I got the stack. You saw it in in my office this week. The the F one, which is a foreign registration, before they did the S one. I've been plowing through the F one. It's like this thick, and it, it's interesting. I mean, Arm's got like nearly a hundred percent gross margin, but the but that's it's not growing, but it's kind of anomalous. And so you know, I've been very very positive on Arm, the whole ecosystem, and I think. I, I think there's real reason to be positive. You know, it's just a little little back history. Remember, uh, SoftBank bought Arm for, I don't know, what, high 30s, 38 billion, something like that. They were going to sell it to, or 30 billion-ish, low 30s. They were going to sell it to mm -hmm. NVIDIA for, I think, 43 yeah. billion. The UK or EU and US basically killed that deal. That would have been awesome for NVIDIA before the whole NVIDIA trillion dollar baby hype. And so then now our uh, SoftBank is floating 10% of ARM and it's it, it, at, at like there was around originally a 50 or so billion dollar valuation. So, okay, so they're making money on the deal, but it's only 10% that they're floating. So they've got upside, but they've also got downside. And then the stock was only up around 5% all day. And then right toward the close, it jumped up 24%. And then it was up again 
yesterday and it's up, you know, it's basically flat today, kind of unched. But that, you know, so now it's got a $66 billion market cap. Okay, is that overpriced? First of all, I will say this, don't ever buy stocks <laughs> at the IPO. The market's going <laughs> to tank and all these overhyped stocks, you'll have a better chance to buy them, whether it's Snowflake, when Databricks comes out, Alibaba, when it came out, Snap, Facebook, all of them, they go lower. You know, so you're going to have better opportunities to buy. You usually get screwed yeah. if you buy in the first day. <laughs> um, but I would say that long term, I, I think the story that nobody's talking about here, John, is the impact on Intel. Everybody's talking about ARM and AI and, and you know, it, can they compete with NVIDIA? It's really not, a, not AI. It's total bullshit. I mean, NVIDIA is based on ARM, <laughs> okay? So how is ARM not participating in AI? Apple. It, you know, the new iPhones, it's, it's ARM-based. You know, you, 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 you look at the progression of the A chip, what are we at, A17 now? They're down at three nanometer at TSMC. So of course it's AI, AI inferencing at the edge, ARM is going to dominate that. And my point though on Intel is ARM is going to come into, it is coming into the enterprise. So many people are like, well, it's not really in the enterprise. Yes, it is. It's in the form of NVIDIA. It's in the form of AWS. Google is doing ARM-based stuff. Microsoft is doing ARM-based stuff. And ARM is going to continue to grab more and more share in the enterprise because innovation yeah. happens in consumer markets and then it seeps in to the enterprise markets with a better economic value, lower power, higher performance when you combine everything, lower cost. ARM is a dominant platform. Now, whether or not it's going to be a dominant business because yeah. of its business model, we, we can have that conversation, but it is changing well, the game well, and, and, well, the numbers. And, 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 and destroying Intel's monopoly. I mean, that's a great statement. That's really, um, that's not even over the top. I think it's legit, good analysis there. And I would say that you brought up the, the issue of the business model. This is what people I think under, don't understand. I want you to get, give me your take because you have a good read on this. ARM, and all those things you mentioned, Amazon in the form of NVIDIA, great, ARM is not making the chips, okay, per se. Okay, and so ARM is pervasive. The other point you made there was the consumer and enterprise um, kind of in relationship, power dynamic between which market leads and follows. The enterprise market is becoming more and more agile and speed, speed oriented like consumer. In other words, the consumer aspect of leading and then lagging the enterprise used to be maybe five years, Dave, back in the, go back 20 years during the web, right. everything was consumer first. Now you're seeing with developers such in the front lines, um, a B to D to C, meaning business to developer to consumer. The apps themselves in the enterprise are very consumer-like. We've been talking about consumerization of IT for over a decade and a half, if not two decades. The consumerization right. of IT is beyond that now. It's consumerization of enterprise. So I think the enterprise market and uh, the consumer market relative to technology is converging. That's why so many new people are coming into the enterprise of which we had an unfettered access to cover. We didn't have a lot of competition in the enterprise, Silicon Angle and the Cube. So you start to see more action. It's sexy to be in there. It's cool to be in the enterprise. Why? Because the consumer side of that isn't really about business, but the developers. It's a, not B to B or B to C, it's B to D to C. B to D to B to C. So business to developer, the developers are driving all the change. So, so that's a great point. And I want to unpack that in another podcast with you. Let's yeah. talk about ARM. ARM relates directly to the developer because the apps being built right now in this new AI era is a platform shift. And every inflection point has a platform that changes the application framework and the infrastructure, underlying infrastructure. Web changed how software was built. The web, HTML. Mobile, form factor, app store, mobile devices, that platform changed apps. Now AI is that third platform that changes, and in a good way, how the apps are built. So again, this is why everyone's going crazy over AI. It's not so much AI washing. It's the fact that you have to live on the AI platform to be relevant and for the applications, the functionality is going to be there. Everyone will have it, just like everyone had the web. So when the web came out, oh, it's, it's overhyped. No one's going to have food delivered to their house. Instant carts going public, Dave. 
it happened. So the web actually happened. Everything they said would happen, happened. People trade online, they do business online, they date online, they do things online, they're online. So everything is online. The connectivity happened, that applications all moved over. You know, first web-based, mobile-based, now AI, the third transformation technology. This is huge. That's why I think people don't understand that ARM actually is inherently AI because of that. Now, that's that's kind of like my my piece of it. The business models where people get confused. Explain to people how ARM, why ARM's important and how they make money. Because who makes the chips? It's not like you say Intel. Intel has a fab. They make chips. Yeah. yeah. So ARM's different. Explain the nuance and then and how that could hurt the price or change the price on the upside. Yeah, so ARM basically is a framework that is that it licenses and its software allows customers to take off the shelf uh, ARM CPU, people don't realize they make GPUs, they make NPUs, the neural processing unit, and you can take those off the shelf sort of standard design, the design framework, and then you can design your own chips around it. You can, you can just take the ARM spec as it is, or to your point about developers, you can program the components. So the, the example I like to use, a couple is, but the, the, my, one of my favorites is Tesla, who basically takes the standard, but they customize the neural processing unit. That's how they got rid of LiDAR. That's how they're able to use very low cost cameras on their car and cut out, you know, thousands of dollars of cost by programming the neural processing unit. That's their IP. So Tesla owns that IP, okay? And so ARM gets paid for the, the license and the, the, the value of ARM is when Tesla or Apple or AWS with Annapurna, when they design a chip, and then they give it to TSMC or Samsung to manufacture, those specifications are locked and loaded. So the time it takes to get to tape out when you can actually have a chip that's you know, good yield is much compressed. And ARM's latest announcement compressed that even further. So historically in the x86 world, it's you know, four or five years to get to a new design. ARM could, took that down to 18 months and now they're taking it down to a year because of the tight specifications that you license from ARM. So ARM is a, it, it, they're pure licensing company. That's why their gross margins are nearly 100%, but then they leave the value add for their ecosystem. Okay, and so that in a way negatively affects ARM's opportunity because they're leaving so much meat in the bone for the ecosystem, but it becomes a dominant business model where ARM wafer volumes completely dwarf those of x86, and as we've talked about before on QPod, volume in semiconductor is everything. If you can't double your cumulative volumes, you can't lower your cost as fast. The, the, the company that's on that doubling of vol, cumulative volume curve, which is the ARM ecosystem now, has better fab costs, you know, faster chip design, so TSMC benefits, Samsung, you know, which is number two benefits, and companies like Apple and Tesla and AWS and others get to market faster. And meanwhile, Intel's fighting a end front war. Fabs with yeah. TSMC, they're getting you know, beat by AMD. They're, they're getting <laughs> nailed by Nvidia. It's like, you know, yeah. the Intel's Russian front. Intel's taking a lot of shrapnel. A lot, they're getting a lot of, lot of shrapnel. Yeah, and I know a lot of times people think it make it sound like I'm rooting against Intel. Of course not. I mean, it's a, good for America, good for Intel is good for America, but they're just, they, they're just falling further behind. They could be a dinosaur. I mean, the ARM thing is interesting. I mean, I, I think you're right on the AI. I think that people don't understand that AI is on devices. And so if you look at ARM, they're everywhere. I mean, they're about 75% or 70% um, on, of all people in the world use ARM technology in some sort of device. Okay, and you mentioned Tesla. We actually had an exclusive interview on SiliconANGLE, Dipti Vishani, Senior Vice President and General Manager of ARM's automotive line of business. He said the IPO will enable ARM to take a greater role in AI workloads, especially in the execution of the models that, in, that require edge uh, support rather than 
um, data centers in the cloud. They think the edge is going to be huge. And that's what that was your point in your analysis. So I think that's a big thing. Yep. And then he had a comment we're, we were AI before AI was cool. And that's what everyone says, but, but it's interesting. I think but it's true. <laughs> it's true. The <laughs> facial recognition uses the GPU, the arm GPU in Apple. That's AI. I, mean, I would call that AI. I mean, it's AI. <laughs> Yeah, well, what, when asked, we put that question to him about NVIDIA. You brought up NVIDIA. He said, this is his quote. He said, despite NVIDIA's leadership in AI, thanks to its powerful GPUs, graphical processing units, AI also requires CPU units like ARM designs for pre-processing data. So that accelerates AI within the GPU necessary because of the low power. Again, your point about the iPhone and these mm -hmm. devices, the low power devices, they, they had a stronghold early on on low power devices. That's going to be massive. That means things like smaller devices will have cameras in them and we'll be able to do shit with computer vision. And then, you know, you know we'll get to the Unity thing, but all kinds of things are going on in devices with pre-processing and then also bolt on um, hardware acceleration opportunities at the edge. So, you know, everyone talks about data being the AI, piece of the AI. Well, you can't move data around, Dave. You move... Right. You move compute and workloads to data. So the relationship between edge, central core computing architectures, ARM's perfectly positioned to kind of orchestrate that and manage the resource, whether it's a GPU uh, or other component. So connectivity is the new compute, right? And we're going to talk about this at supercomputing event we're going to go to in Denver, which is a show that should is usually a canary in the coal mine for all the big trends. So, so that should be very interesting. Ployer and I did a chart, um, you know, actually it was a while ago. It basically looked at percent of spending on the vertical axis and, and time was the horizontal axis. And we basically said today, this is 2020, that most of the AI is, is, is modeling that's done in the data center for things like ad tech and pricing and fraud detection and, you know, supply chains, whatever. And, and very low was in terms of the, the spending were, was things like you know, Alexa and smartphones and facial recognition. And we had that, that flipping in terms of percent spending where still going to be a lot of modeling done in the cloud, but the vast majority of the spend by we had the end of the decade, and it's probably going to be even to be more accelerated is like level three plus autonomous driving, traffic optimization, AR, VR, power grid, industry 4.0, smart factories, intelligent robots, all that stuff is going to be low power, low cost, high performance, and I, it's going to be ARM-based dominant because they're way, way ahead of everybody. People talk about you know, the, the, the all-in guys. Well, Risk Five is there, so Chamat hates anything that he didn't you know, make a ton of money on, so he'll, <laughs> he'll shit all over it. But, you know, it's been, you know, to his credit, he was first in crypto, early in Facebook, early in SPACs and made a lot of money, but, but he could have said, oh, ARM is worth only 10 billion, which is nonsense. ARM is going to dominate, that ARM architectures are going to dominate that, the, the future of AI inferencing at the edge. And to me, the reason I love ARM is that ecosystem value add for the Apples and the Teslas and the Amazons of the world is enormous and it yeah. completely changes the game on the reliance of a single monopoly which has been yeah. Intel for all these years, yeah. you know, we'll see what kind of competition in NVIDIA gets and how they respond yeah. <laughs> to the inferencing at the edge. It's nice that I like the all in reference to Chamath. Uh, there. Those guys are doing great at all. And they had, the, by the way, this week they had their big event. They had such a great follow and they have a big presidential candidate. I'm happy to see Jason do well over there. Uh, uh, but we, um, we're too small for him now, but he, I'm still friends. Well, oh, I love their sure shit. That, I mean, I, I Ch it's a, it's Chamath. A, it's Chamath better than like the meet the press nonsense, you know? He was, Chamath was wrong about ARM though. And again, Chamath is very dogmatic thinker and he's very much will die on hills. Like he's, he's one of those people who likes to, he's bold, he's a bold and guy. He's, a, he's a, sometimes a little bit brazen, some people say, but yeah, he was wrong about ARM and he wouldn't walk it back. Um, and that's why, you know, he, that's just his style. I mean, Chamath, sometimes he's, you know, he's better be lucky than good sometimes. Well, he did you know? say, he, 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 he does say he loves like out of the money, long out of the money options. And that's not ARM, you know, that's, that's Vivek for president, 
Okay, that's how we, those are the well, bets Shemoff he likes got, to make. It's Shem, paid Shemoff, off for the guy. Shemoff, no, well, he, mm. Shemoff got killed on SPACs, although he probably got his money out. No, he made yeah. tons of dough on SPACs, John. He well, got out. All, he got, well, he got out, but a lot of people lost. So he got hammered by the media on that. They no, he got hammered by because, the media, but he made a shitload of money. So Yeah, but he <laughs> lost, he lost a lot of money for other people. That's not the investment game. Yeah, well, yeah. he pocketed yeah. a lot of dough. It's like, it's like Dave, Dave, I made a lot of money, but, you know, sorry to fuck you over. Well, that's you know? basically I mean, his his attitude. You know? It's like, hey, yeah, I got in early. I made a lot of money. What do you want from me? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, not a, that's not a long game view of being an investor. Uh, well, you know, hey, as he says, I'm in the arena. Try him. Um, so let's, let's talk, but I'll talk about trying the arena. Let's talk about this Google DOJ trial. So it's an tr actual trial challenging Google's dominance in search, which, I mean, they got a case, Dave. They Here's my rant, John. Market. Get into my rant. Go ahead. Okay. okay. They got a 90, 80 something percent market share. They got Google, uh, Gmail. There's so much cross pollination. Search is huge revenue for them. It's their only big thing. It's like the product that just keeps gift that keeps giving. So, you know, I mean, I'm not for the trial, but like they got a case, you know, how people can break into the search business. Like, how does Google say they have competition in search? Really? Um, you know, they do. I mean, I've always said search is not as relevant as it used to be, but they're they're on all the desktops, right? They. I, mean, I remember when Google back in the day killed the whole toolbar game. You know, we had a business, my, my brother Joe and I um, had a business around that and he ended up running it and he had great distribution of toolbars. Back in the day, you'd download a toolbar to help you navigate and type words in and before Google really was a good search engine had direct navigation. They killed all those toolbars. You know why? They didn't want anyone installing on their browser. So even though they let Chrome extensions exist, Google controls all the, the redirects for internet traffic. So they, they locked that down. So that's a monopoly <laughs> move. That's a monopoly <laughs> move, Dave. I mean, I mean, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Having, okay. So let's talk about this. So <clears throat> having a monopoly in and of itself is not illegal. Do you agree? I, I don't know even that what that means. Like so the very I, fact I don't, that you, I, don't need, if, I don't even know what I'm agreeing. If on, you so okay, would, if you've yeah, if you've I'm not, achieved, I'm not a legal scholar. So okay, like but I but I, you know, I'm not either. But if, if but it's not against the law to have a monopoly. It's against the law to use monopolistic power in a way that is anti-competitive. So, for example, if you're bundling, or if you're giving away shit for free in order to keep a, to kill a competitor. That's illegal. And so what the DOJ is arguing is that by paying $30 billion a year, which I think 20 billion of that goes to Apple and other uh, 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 companies that, that to have Google search embedded as the default, that that is an illegal move. So I would say, okay, here's what I would love to see happen, John. I'd love to see Google say, okay, we won't spend $30 billion anymore. We'll just drop that to our bottom line, okay? And you know what would happen if they weren't the default browser? They'd, they'd, they'd probably in 80% of the cases be returned to the default browser. So they probably wouldn't, they probably maybe would lose 10 billion but they dropped 30 billion to the bottom line. I bet you it would be a $20 billion gain for them. You know, I'm sure they've done the math where that's not the case, but, but I bet yeah, you, I, mean, I bet you it doesn't hurt them. I bet you they make well, more money if the DOJ wins this case. I think it's bullshit, my opinion. Okay. Well, I mean, I've always liked to watch the spectacle of it. Again, it's lost in, in, in the hype this week. Again, it was really overshadowed by arm. It's really overshadowed by all the other news. So it's really, amazing week you know um like, like the, the big story that we were living was the mgm ransomware attack so oh we had God. an event we had an event in vegas and, and our guys were there lining up mgm the entire casino was was taken over shut down on by ransom ransomware that was held hostage and and i heard that they were going through the slots machines um, and almost got there so essentially the hacker group an english-speaking hacker group took over through social engineering, the entire computer system of MGM. MGM is not one property. It's like a lot of properties. It's the Aria, it's the Cosmo, it's the MGM Grand. It's a bunch of those hotels are all kind of networked in 
through that consolidation of the corporate that they have. So it's massive. We were staying at the Aria uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, and um, I got it just in time. So they had gotten their systems up. MGM didn't pay. Caesars got hit. They just paid. So this is a case where MGM said, we're not going to pay the ransom. Can you imagine? NFL kicked off on Sunday, how much they lost in the sports book, how much gambling they lost. Brutal. Did they even have, then people were waiting in line to get in. They had to check in and went in manually. The elevators weren't working. I mean, Dave, it was like a doomsday scenario. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, sure. this goes this to show you, I mean, we're doing this Dell, this Dell, um, resilience um, security thing, uh, road to re data resilience, which is about data back and recovery, all that good stuff that Dell has. This is exactly what we've been talking about in the cube. There's so many seams in the, in the system now for, for hackers. And with the human element, remember we talk about human plus AI is better than AI. Well, guess what? The hackers are more effective. You did a survey on this weeks ago. The, I think this is just the beginning of, of an Armageddon of hacks. Uh, ransomware is legit. It's happening everywhere. And this is just a high profile a casino. They're supposed to be bulletproof, Dave. Yeah, I, it's unbelievable. I know. It's unbelievable. You think they have the it, best security, it's, right? This should be the top story, in my opinion. Not all the, the fanboys going gushing over the new IPO market that, that's not even open, that people <laughs> want to pretend is open. Oh, it's so, open. Go. So you mentioned, um, actually, I just want to say, uh, uh, just to close out on the, uh, you know, is, does this mean IPOs are back? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's, this was not a super hyped situation. I mean, being up 24% on opening day is not that great, yeah. especially when it was so tepid early in the day. So I think people are still very, very cautious, but but on the, you've mentioned the navigating the road to cyber resiliency. I interviewed Keith Bradley, who it was the, the head of IT at uh, uh, Nature's Fresh about the anatomy of their hack. And it was a classic case. And he, you know, he, he was able to recover uh, but it was scary, and then he realized, "Wow, I, I got to get my shit together. I got to, I got to, I got to figure out my end-to-end -end cyber strat, you know, resilient strategy. I need to protect my backup because they're going to go after that." So I don't know. I haven't dug in and heard what MGM did, but I, I want to describe the situation. You got there before I did. I got stuck on the tarmac in Boston, and I was. You guys were texting me saying oh, MGM got hacked. So when you check, what time did you check in? Uh, 637. And, and what was that like? Was there a big long line? Did it take no, forever to the, check in? There was No, there wasn't a long line. They had gotten, it was the day before it was impacted. The two days before actually were impacted. They got the, they got the reservation systems up for the hotel, but they couldn't do credit card transactions. Right. And they it's, still couldn't do it for days later. And today I was just seeing it's still not up. Did they escort you to your room? Nope. So the day and before routine. you got there, people were telling me, the guys who were, got into SAS Explore early, they had to be escorted to the room because what was happening is guests were coming in with their key card and the room wasn't, it was somebody else's room. So the systems were so fucked up, they couldn't you know, you know, map to the new rooms. They didn't know which rooms were actually empty. So what they started to do is they would escort the guests to the room to make sure that the room was actually available. <laughs> and so, and now, by the time I got there, it was late. It was like 1.30 in the morning. It was a huge line to get in. And it was only like two or three people at the check-in. Yeah. So, you know, because they can't hire people, right? They, they're, these hotels are hurting. And so they had to physically write down all your credit card information. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing with that piece of paper? And they're like, oh, yeah. well, well, we're, we're queuing them up and then the manager's going to type them in manually and then they shred them. And I was like, okay. I was trying to think of which credit card I give. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> which one do I care the least about getting hacked? And then she puts the piece of paper on the desk. I was like, can you please turn that piece of paper over? What do you mean? I don't want my credit card hanging out. Somebody could come by and take a picture. So. So that was a nightmare. Everything was manual, but here was the most, the wildest thing. So the Aria is right across the street from the MGM. If, if you've been to Vegas, the MGM has got the big lion. It's all green and neon. When I pulled in with the cab to the Aria, the MGM's on the right, the Aria's on the left. MGM was pitch black. No neon signs. It, could, it was, there was a few hotel room lights on at like one in the, 1.30 in the morning. 
It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen out in Vegas. Yeah, I mean, it was bad. I mean, it's it's one of those stories, Dave, where it doesn't get a lot of attention, but it means a lot. And I think that's, you know, important. It's, it's a lot more important than the is the IPO mark, which we're going to get to in a minute. So the, it's it's a whole nother ball game. But the, but the, let's, the other thing I wanted to bring up on this. But wait, wait, you know what? You know what? Last thing I want to say there is it didn't affect the SAS Explore Conference at all. What SAS did, I mean, it did in the sense that with, when you were setting up, they, you couldn't check in. So the SAS Explorer said, hey, come on over here. We got cocktails, we got champagne, we got swag we're giving away. So they, they had like a pre-party. Hey, greet everybody. And just like killed time before people could check in and nobody was complaining. So that was a pretty amazing job by the SAS folks. Well, did you see that uh, this week, speaking of events, that Salesforce uh, had their Dreamforce conference in San Francisco? And uh, someone was funny. Someone was saying that you know, got the all the AI, AI announcements, and someone said, um, "There's Mark Benioff talking about the future of AI next to a bunch of plastic trees." Kind of sums up their AI strategy. Um, and, and it was very pejorative in the comment. They think that the, the AI washing is an all-time high. Salesforce being Salesforce, that's what that was the next tweet. So, you know, I think Salesforce had a lot of great announcements, but people were calling it like the most epic. AI wash because it was so good. The announcements were just perfect. Oh my God, they're going to be great. They, the next level of AI, they just nailed the, the messaging. Uh, Dreamforce nailed the messaging and they had a great party. They do a great event uh, in terms of um, put on a great program. I saw the new CMO of uh, AWS, Regine Skillern. She was at a, um, uh, a concert. She had some, some footage. Um, Dave Matthews band was doing, Dave Matthews was doing a little show there, very intimate. So the Dreamforce does this really big event and they spend a lot of money, Dave. They do a huge event. They got a huge customer base. I was at the big tower in San Francisco. Um, and here's the, here's the ironic thing. Okay. Again, quasi rant here. They're leaving San Francisco. They're bringing Dreamforce. They're leaving the city. Mark Benioff has a building there. He built there. He's you like can a, walk there from know, the Moscone. He, he's, He's personal friends with former mayor Gavin Newsom. Some, some say good in line to take over for Biden, okay, who he did his fireside chat with. So here you got Benioff. By the way, Benioff, I think, is the godfather to one is Gavin Newsom's kid or vice versa. No, Gavin Newsom's kid. They're close. And he's leaving the city. I mean, that is like, to me, that is like the biggest tell sign that everything that people were talking about in San Francisco is true. When the guy who pledged millions for the homeless is taking his flagship conference out of San Francisco. Where's he going? That's Vegas? That's massive. You're going I think to Vegas? it's Vegas. I think he's that's going a, to Vegas. That's a cost so, move. I mean, San Francisco is so expensive. Dave, you can walk Dave, to the Salesforce Tower Dave, from Moscone. The, the guy, the guy's rich. No, they I know, but I'm just save money. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> but you can walk to the Salesforce Tower from Moscone. We've done it. We've had shows there. Right? Cube has been there in the Salesforce Tower. Bit, that this is the most show we did. Ugly, this is the ugliest look. For San Francisco, it's bad because it's basically saying the city, the son of the city, is Salesforce because they're the modern brand, they're tech brand, they're, they make a lot of money, they have a big tower, the tallest building in the city, close to Moscone, they do their event every year, they shut down the streets for them to pick up their ball and leave to another city is bad. Now, if that is not an indictment on the current administration in San Francisco, nothing else is other than more people dying and more homeless people lying on the sidewalk, shooting up and doing fentanyl. Because that is so bad that if someone doesn't like wake up, Gary Tan, who runs Y Combinator, he's been very proactive on rallying the tech community to get rid of the administrators in the city and the politicians. That's guys, he's been, he's been a baller. And um, other younger, younger than us uh, in, in their 30s and late 40s, they have families. They're like, this is ridiculous. They want change. So this movement, I hope, continues. And Benioff should not leave. He should stay in San Francisco. Yeah, so I agree. Mark, I mean, Mark, and Mark, if you're listening, please don't leave the you're city. Right. Be a leader and set the agenda and, and use your influence with the former mayor, now governor, to clean up that shit. It's, it's, Moscone is over three times the price and is 10x the potential for crime and death. Who wants to go there? Nobody. Nobody wants to go there. It is so, like it's it's bad. It is bad. Um, but now Google <clears throat> was in at Moscone. Databricks was at Moscone. Um, Snowflake next year is at Moscone. 
So people are still, you know, supporting the venue and the venue's awesome. It's just the surrounding area is scary. You know, and the hotels are ridiculous in terms of the cost. You got to stay at the, if you're late, you got to stay at the shit hotel for $550 a night, $600 a night. But we were, we were at RSA's there. We were at RSA, remember? I was like, hey, John, I'm kind of afraid to walk alone to my hotel, which is sort of on the border of the Tenderloin. You mind walking me back? And I kind of convinced you to stay the night, remember? <laughs> Don't drive back to Palo Alto. Hang with me. <laughs> but it was like five, six hundred bucks a night to, for, to stay there. I, I, I've walked through so much crime here. I mean, I, I'm used to it. Uh, well, they, we got another 20 minutes. We got we got a, a busy Friday. I know you've got to go. Um, some other news. Larry Ellison made his first trip up to um, Redmond to do a deal with Microsoft. In his entire career, Larry Ellison, one of the captains of the industry, still the CEO of his company, founder, um, still making making it making waves, doing cloud, and they're making some some movement in the cloud by the market share numbers. But he flew up there to sit down with with the Microsoft and do a deal. They're putting Oracle hardware and database into Azure into Azure data centers. They're run, letting customers run Oracle on Azure. So it's Oracle on that infrastructure. So uh, two things, one, Larry finally in his career, at the end of his career, making a visit to Microsoft, the evil empire in his mind. They think he's the evil empire, but not anymore. Um, and two, is it a desperate move? Is it a desperate move by Oracle? Or is it a desperate move no. by Microsoft? No, it's, is, it's is, a is great this like move. Amazon, it's a is great this like move. VMware, is this like VMware deal with AWS or is it a, what's, what's your take? I have my opinion. I'll let you go first. So your, first your of all, on hot take on Larry Ellison. I, I mean, it's, it's easy to criticize Oracle. Everybody you know, loves to do it and pile on. But I've said, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, Larry Ellison has great respect for technology. He's maintained relevance through investment in R&D as not only the chairman and the CTO of the company, he directs capital toward R&D, both organic and inorganic. Uh, doesn't always get it right the first time, but sticks with it, attracts great talent, uh, has a very high degree of respect for the latest technology advancements and brings that in to Oracle. And there's so many examples of that with uh, automation, AI, what they've done with MySQL Heatwave, which, you know, a lot of it is brute force, but it's impressive as hell what they can do, what they did with engineered systems and Exadata. Those are, are, are directed, deliberate, hardcore R&D investments that turn R&D into product that Oracle sells for billions and billions of dollars that drops a shitload of cash to the bottom line. They are an awesome business. Now, as it relates to the Microsoft- Don't, don't, forget, the, don't forget their sales force is good too. They have a great field fantastic team. Fantastic field team, very strong relationships with GSIs who you know love to, to, to cut big deals. Uh, as they say, they make great acquisitions, even though the Cerner acquisition has been weighing on earnings. The Sun acquisition, everybody criticized that. It enabled them to build Exadata. And that's what they're putting into Microsoft data centers, Azure data centers. When they, when they first did the Microsoft Oracle deal, we looked at that, Flora and I looked at it very closely. And we said, that's a form of super cloud. You're spanning multiple clouds with an abstraction layer. You know, they use Terraform and some other custom you know, code to, to simplify that experience for developers. But it was essentially a seamless experience across the two clouds. And I remember at SuperCloud, SuperCloud One, I think it was, John, I was going at it with Insic Ray, who <laughs> I, I said, oh, that's an example of a SuperCloud. He goes, oh, you lost me at Oracle. Uh, I was I sort of shot back. Yeah, there's another VC who just wants to shit on Oracle and then sell his company to them. But that was kind of funny. Insic was, was hilarious. He's a smart dude. But so anyway, it was kind of tongue in cheek. But I think I think I think, I think he was basically referring to how in, lack of innovation Oracle is. Yeah, but they don't really have it. They're they're not an innovative company in the sense of they don't invent new things. They're followers. They have fast followers they though, but they are fast yeah, followers. They, and by the way, uh, yeah. by the way, well, you could say they didn't invent anything, fine. but they, I would say they invented, you know, the the modern uh, 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 engineered system. 
They, because everybody else, and I guess you could argue they were fast followers. Everybody was doing converged infrastructure. Remember with VCE, you had, you had, you had uh, uh, Cisco UCS, you bolted on an EMC Symmetrix or VMAX or whatever they called it. You had VMware stuffed inside and they called it a SKU. What Oracle did is they actually built hardware and they built the iPhone of engineered systems, hardware and software working together in a, in a truly engineered system. Was that innovative? Was it kind of a fast follow? It's not like wildly innovative, like, you know, open AI, but it was a fast follower in that they built a better mousetrap using yeah. the latest and greatest technologies. And they, and they tied it to a business model that is far superior than anything else out there with very few exceptions. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just have, I just have my, my very simple view about Oracle, but you know, go ahead. I mean, my view is, on me. well, well, the simple view is, is, like you said, they're a great business. They have the database. What they did was in the early days is they took the database, innovated it to compete against IBM early days and they went in and used that database and built a business on top of it and so they didn't have to be innovative in their business because the database market was very lucrative for oracle and their strategy was simply to be innovative in the sense of making sure they don't miss anything to grow their business and so what they did was would sit back and watch everyone you know get bloody as they invent stuff and you know what's the old expression first one through the walls first is gets the bloodiest and fails that's the way it usually it is in silicon valley and that's why he would always poo poo the vcs because he says i'll let the startups everyone show me the way but once he sees a market he's smart enough with the team to say that market is important for oracle okay he even poo pooed cloud remember clouds that's nothing it's just data centers he was totally like he basically missed cloud <laughs> but he didn't miss hold on hold on he didn't he, he missed cloud dave <laughs> Really, come on! You, you can't even. You How can't can you even say, say he that. missed cloud? Okay, okay. okay. So he he's got a cloud. Said, he's kicking ass in cloud. How can okay. you say oh, he yeah. missed cloud? Not exactly a fast follower either, by the way. But he followed cloud. He got it now. It's good for his business. He has to have cloud. So, are you saying he could have been a hyperscaler? Yes, he could have been a hyperscaler. He had more than I, Amazon did. If you got Amazon, he basically poo pooed cloud publicly from the beginning for at least eight years. Okay. Even so if he point missed where Larry it, Ellison, if, even if, to the point where Andy Chassis baited him so much on reInvent keynotes that he finally said, let's take our engineered systems and call it cloud. And that's what he did. We recovered his announcements. That's not bad for business. He's smart. That's my point. He was late to the cloud, hardly a fast follower. But other markets, he was fast. You're right, hyperscaler. He saw that as critical for the data center, his core market, and built that in there. So their strategy was simple. Take their great business and keep growing it. And any good business sometimes doesn't have to be the the innovator poster child. Apple likes to be because that's kind of their thing um, to be the next big thing. But even they're slowing down to be fast falls because they don't have to be the innovative ones. Even their last launch wasn't that good. So again, this comes back down to how the big winning companies go. Even Amazon, are they going to be the most innovative? They're kind of fast following AI. Again, this is what big companies do if that's what they have to do. They don't have to be innovative always to the core. Now they can be quote innovative and entrepreneurial. I mean, those are, that's kind of and that's a, you know, there's a lot of similarities. Cultural. Between, there's a lot of similarities between AWS and Oracle. By the way, I mean, there's a lot now, of differences. Now there is. There are a lot now of differences. You know, Oracle was all the wood behind Oracle database, uh, whereas Amazon's got you know multiple databases. But but there but there are some similarities in terms of lock-in, in terms of just aggressive. Selling, well, add on, add um, ons, add ons, add ons. You know, making yeah. stuff on top of it. I mean, now, Amazon is kind of like Oracle in the sense that now with AI, this is why I'm bullish on Amazon with AI. They won't get the fanfare, and this is where their their risk is. This we pointed this out at Google Next, if and our other pod. If they don't get that young developer demographic, like I pointed out last pod, they could miss this window of this new platform. That's like Microsoft poo pooing search and mobile, right? Or I'm not having their own phone. Oracle's in cloud. I think Oracle will continue to have a cloud product. And they have an opportunity with AI to move their compute advantage and their engineering systems to be much more front and center. Just like Dell has an opportunity to be a, get back in the server game because the old server models on a decline, the, the AI server models are merging. So what does that look like? So again, AI as a new platform offers everybody an opportunity, right? To, if they have the goods to reposition themselves. So Amazon will come into AI and will do extremely well in my opinion, but they're going to be faster followers onto what they know will happen. 
Microsoft beat them to the punch on thought leadership and public opinion and hype. They poo pooed it initially. We have AI too, and now they're like all in on Gen AI. So again, this is what this is all they got to do. Well, the door is open like for Oracle. Google too. The door is open for Google. I would say this about Oracle though. I mean, I do have a great deal of respect. And I, yeah, you know, I agree with what you're saying. It's a great business. It, 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 it's largely the business model and just business acumen. You know, Oracle used to criticize people for writing checks, not code. Meaning, guys like CA would go out and buy companies. You know, all his competitors around and were buying companies. <laughs> and then one day, you know, Charles Phillips wrote a a, a piece. He was a Wall Street analyst about how the software industry applications software is going to consolidate. Ellison hired him to actually be his M and A guy, and they built an application powerhouse. And then, yeah. and then, this is what I mean by Oracle respecting technology. They built Fusion. It took them like ten years to do it, but their shit is integrated. Whereas you compare that to IBM WebSphere, this like collection of of apps that Steve Mills bought that never really yeah. came together. So Oracle, you know, because it made those R&D investments in a coherent manner, has, has continues to win. They just, they just win. And so- hey, I, we, we forgot some news actually this week. That like all of all yeah, this big news. Tell, what's that? I, I, forgot, I forgot to tell you. Oh, you we, we shocked about it. There was a, a AI government or hearing at Congress, closed door session. Elon Musk was there, Bill Gates was there, Mark Zuckerberg was there, and the CEO, the co-founder of Hugging Face was there. Yeah. Cube alumni, we had a Cube alumni. Satya Nantella was there. All the luminaries and everyone got, Musk got all the attention because he was there, but, um, and they're all like, AI could kill us. This is good for our rant section, actually. So regulation is coming. They're all saying that AI needs to be regulated. So Musk says AI could kill us all. That's what he said in closed door session. So you get <laughs> so you get a what? bunch of politicians <laughs> and a bunch of tech CEOs, basically, sort of architecting yeah. the future of AI Billion, regulation. Bill, billionaires, except for oh, Sam Altman was there, and so was Jensen, and so I mean, I'm not sure that's the door. answer, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Charles Schum Chuck Schumer did it, uh, convened the session, but this is the government trying to get involved. I mean, I just find it, this is like, this is the classic guardrails. I think we just got to just say guardrails. We're going to put guardrails in place and just get the government out of the action for now. It's become such a political hot potato. They just got to stay out of the technology. This is my rant and for, for the day, but government stay the heck out of AI and don't let the big companies head fake you into thinking it needs to be regulated because the startups will get hurt from this. So any regulation of any kind is not good for the industry. Keep an eye on it, put guardrails in place, but get the hell out of the regulation conversation. Now, that being said, there is a global aspect to it. And that's what, what I think needs to be the focus. Look at it globally and start thinking about formulation of policy and, and potential doctrine around AI. Because I think the real AI conversation isn't about regulating it because it's bad for society. I think it's a cybersecurity issue. And I think the, 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 the dots to connect is looking at these ransomware attacks, okay, and other potential cyber warfare uh, tactics. AI will be just as good to help the bad guys be better at being bad. So just like it helps humans be good at what they do. So AI is definitely going to create a lot of productivity, Dave, and a lot of that productivity is going to be for the evil people. So, you know, that's a, an area that you know, a lot of people are just going gaga over, oh, there's Sam Altman, you know, and oh, there's Mark Zuckerberg, you know, this Elon Musk, let's go to the all-in summit, rah, rah. No, there's a lot of bad shit happening. And I think the AI can be played properly with startup innovation and new brands that could emerge to solve the problem. So I'd much rather see the conversation be, these are the problems we want to leverage AI to solve. Better what user experience, better government, better society, better human beings, Those, that's the, and better education. The education system's a mess. Okay, but John, where do you land on things like copyright? If if ChatGPT is sucking copyright in or other AI has taken other copyrighted materials, 
sort of using that to Again, create I'm, other I'm artifacts. Not, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar, but I mean, copyright's been going on for since the dawn of time. So you're saying, let it go. My, you know, you're saying, let it go. Let it go. Let it, let it play out. Let it play out. Yeah. Mm. People are going to be, but you know, hurt, but you know, people are going to be like bumming out. Oh yeah. You know, but common sense prevails. I don't know the answer. Again, copyright since the caveman days has been an issue, you know? Um, so, Okay. Let so it, let it figure. So I say let it let it go down the road a little bit, and then look at it, and let the artist show. Because one of the things that's coming out of the copyright thing with the writers, Hollywood, is that the younger, the new artists are emerging that aren't even part of Hollywood. I mean, Mr. Beast pulls massive numbers on YouTube. Yeah, I know. Okay, so you have people on strike saying we'll save our work. Well, guess what? The replacements are coming in. So again, sports media, Hollywood media. You know, well, art should be protected, okay? Right. But let but let's not freak out, right? Let's leverage it and and uh, and use it. I think it's a hard problem. I mean, if 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 AI is being used to scrape various books, novels, or whatever, taking, you know, kind of not excerpts but ideas, and then creating its own. I, I mean, I guess you know, in a way, I kind of feel like okay, well, if it can create some kind of new, it happens every day in music, right? I'm not I'm not a musician, but musicians tell me that basically. <laughs> You know, every <laughs> every song has the same fundamental chords to it. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess I guess I you know mostly agree with you. I do think there are some things in terms of bias, uh, in terms of you know things like um, you know approving you know financial you know mortgages and 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 loans and lending and things like that. That you know if AI is doing that, you've got to have some kind of regulations uh, that at least enforce the law, um, but I don't know. I, I'd have to think about it more, but I, but I do know this, sticking a bunch of politicians and a bunch of billionaires in the room to figure it all out probably ain't the right formula. That I agree with. <laughs> uh, well, we're getting some text here from Sarbid on, on uh, some, some stuff here. We got to wrap up, Dave. Uh, anything else on your mind before we wrap up? I've got a couple minutes left here. I'm, I'm going to um, I got. The rest of the weekend. I, I, I'm stoked for Falcon next week. Uh, CrowdStrike's uh, a, a big security conference, and you're going to be at Mandiant, uh, yep. which is another big security conference. So we're going to be almost mm -hmm. bi-coastal. Uh, CrowdStrike yeah. is kicking ass. I'm working on a breaking analysis today. They're going to introduce. Well, they've introduced Charlotte AI, which is their generative mm -hmm. AI tooling. You know, we've talked to a lot of security companies and many have said, well, we're not sure. We're still trying to figure it out, but the leaders are leaning in hard. Uh, yeah. uh, CrowdStrike at Black Hat was demonstrating Charlotte AI, where basically you can have a, a, a natural language conversation with, hey, what's going on in the industry today? What are the big threats? Do I have any exposures in my, uh, my infrastructure? Uh, or uh, uh, Automate a workflow to remediate that and they'll hand it to you and you can actually push a button and make it happen or even have the system do it, which I don't think most people are going to do initially. Um, yeah. and so there's, they demonstrated that at, at Black Hat, whereas most people were had slideware, vaporware. They are announcing pricing for Charlotte AI next week. So I'm really interested to see that because it's going to be one of the early examples of you know, non open AI, Microsoft, Amazon, et cetera, announcing pricing and monetizing yeah. AI. So I'm excited to see that. Well, I'm going to be at Mandiant in DC. You'll be at CrowdStrike. I'm excited for the second half of the year coming up. I think reInvent is going to be a great event for the Cube. Our special coverage we're going to do is going to be three days from our studio. We're going to live stream a program for three days from us being on, on site. We won't have the big Cube there like we do every year. We're going to have only like the editorial Cube. We're going to be up in the press area. Uh, and then we'll do some celebrity appearances around the hall. But for the most part, all the program will be originating out of SiliconANGLE so offices in Palo Alto and Boston area. And we're going to have hosts there moderating our coverage there. That's going to be exciting. The other thing I'm excited about, Dave, is I learned a lot at the SAS Explorer. I mean, I'm getting to know that company there yeah. in North Carolina. Great company and great people. They have an opportunity. They're uniquely positioned with their um, and their customer base, which they have a lot of customers over many, many years, over 47 years they've been in business. The AI is a tailwind from their position. Well, I'm going to do some follow-up with these guys here in, in North Carolina. I'm going to come back and visit their uh, SAS championship um, golf tournament um, and, um, and and get, get more content and get more information and, and look at doing more work with those guys. So I think 
this whole revitalization trend is coming. And I haven't really talked about it publicly yet because I'm just getting my thoughts together on it. But this idea of how AI can revitalize older things is interesting. Legacy code like COBOL to mainframe to minis to applications. And it's going to be an opportunity. It's going to be, I think, a dark horse in the conversation, Dave. And you're going to start to see private AI come into the mix, like private cloud. Rob Stretchy and I are talking about that. So again, a lot, a lot of action. Keep it on siliconangle.com for all the coverage. That's where Dave dropped his breaking analysis. And that's where all the action is. The cube.net is the catalog of all the cube content. You'll check out where we are there. Uh, this is episode 29. Dave, we're going to hit 30 next time. See you next time. And thanks for listening and watching. See you, John.